Did you know FDA-approved Vivgot, Fgotigamod Alpha FCAB, is available for your adult patients? Visit vivgothcp.com to see the data and explore how it works. Vivgot is a registered trademark of Argenex. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hey, this is Jason Crowell. Thanks for listening to today's Neurology Podcast. Today we have Daniel DeLuca joining us today. Daniel is a clinical fellow at Toronto Western Hospital. And we asked him to join us today to talk about a paper that he co-authored titled Racial and Ethnic Differences in Health-Related Quality of Life for Individuals with Parkinson's Disease Across Centers of Excellence. This was published April the 5th in the Journal of Neurology. Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. So we have covered several topics in the last couple of months regarding equity and race differences and social determinants of health. The one that comes to mind most readily is Jeff Ratliff's interview with Dr. Kodigal back on April 13th, where he discussed social determinants of health in patients with movement disorders. But today, specifically, we're talking about racial and ethnic differences in health-related quality of life for folks with Parkinson's disease in particular. So before we get into the paper more specifically, Daniel, would you mind just summarizing the, the key findings from this paper that you all found? We were basically looking at patients that have Parkinson's disease And we were trying to examine a very large group of diverse patients. And the main conclusion of our paper was basically that after examining this large cohort of individuals with Parkinson's disease, patients that were originally from racial and ethnic minorities or underrepresented minorities in research and movement disorders had a lower health-related quality of life compared to white patients. So let's go back and start at the beginning. In in the background to this paper, you discuss the fact that African-American individuals have less access to movement disorder specialists and often experience a delay in diagnosis with regards to movement disorders. What else should we know in terms of background? Are there any other papers that are important for us to understand with regards to disparities amongst different races in individuals living with Parkinson's? Yeah, absolutely. It is known that African-American individuals are less likely than white patients to receive a Parkinson's disease diagnosis and also to receive specialist care or care from a movement disorders neurologist. We also have some evidence suggesting that African-American patients might be diagnosed at later stages of their disease and therefore they might accumulate uh, worse outcomes until they are diagnosed. And there is also some studies discussing that Perhaps African-American patients can experience greater disability and disease severity compared to white patients, as well as cognitive impairment and dementia. I think what is also important to mention is that there are very few studies that examine this population. So in general, we have very little information just simply because we don't include African-American or other racial and ethnic minority patients in our Parkinson's disease studies or at a broader level in our movement disorder studies. Tell us a little bit more about the data you collected. I understand this came from Parkinson's Foundation's Centers of Excellence, and I think you used a questionnaire that's given at those centers. Is that correct? Just to go back a little bit, that the Parkinson's disease centers of excellence are basically designated medical centers across the world. Most of the centers are located in the U.S., but we also have centers in Canada, in Europe, and in Israel. For the purposes of this study, just based on the differences in ethnic designation, we only looked at centers in the United States. So Daniel, tell us, what did you find with respect to differences in quality of life amongst different races and ethnicities? After looking at 8,500 individuals or so, we basically found that patients that were not white or patients that came from a racial and ethnic minority background, such as African-Americans, Hispanic, and Asians, had lower health-related quality of life 
compared to white patients. And to our knowledge, this is the largest study evaluating health-related quality of life in a diverse population, including African-American patients with Parkinson's disease. And we also tried to, to determine some factors or understand the reasons behind it. So we performed some additional analysis, and we also tried to establish a picture of how these patients look like, what's their phenotype, what medications they are on, what kind of complications they experience. And I think that the information that we gather is quite useful and informative to clinicians when they're seeing patients in their practice, because we can have a sense of how these patients look like according to their racial and ethnic group in general. So I understand one of the differences you found in your additional analyses was that some of the quality of life difference might be explained by differences in cognitive performance. Could you unpack that for us? Once we found that health-related quality of life was lower in patients that were non-white, we did perform additional analysis trying to understand the reason behind it. And we realized that one of the key factors in mediating this association was cognitive score, meaning African-American patients specifically, once they had lower cognitive scores, that would mediate this association between health-related quality of life and Parkinson's disease. So we hypothesize that the lower quality of life can be partially mediated by the lower cognitive scores in this population, which is actually well known and established by previous studies. There are definitely some limitations to this, including the fact that we didn't use a very long neuropsych testing, as well as some of these tests have been validated in a majority of white participants. So the validity has been questioned by some professionals in terms of the applicability in other racial and ethnic groups. But we still think that this hypothesis is, is reasonable and probably worth exploring more details in future studies. What other differences did you find, say, for example, with respect to the treatment regimen that patients were on? So what we did find is that African-American patients were less likely to be on dopamine agonists compared to white non-Hispanic patients. And what we thought was very interesting is that despite having similar rates of depression, racial and ethnic minorities were less likely to be prescribed antidepressant medications. And that's even after adjusting or correcting for some clinical data. And obviously, we're just looking back and we cannot say for sure what's the reason behind it. It is very possible that perhaps they had contraindications to being on antidepressive medications, but, but we thought that this was an interesting data that came from our study. Great, Daniel. So what would you say in regards to clinical applicability of this information that you all published? How might this change clinical practice? Yeah, I think one of the key aspects is that we do need more data about racial and ethnic minorities. So I think in the first place, in clinic, especially if you're looking at academic centers, it is quite important to keep an eye open for patients that come from a diverse population make sure that they are eligible for additional research studies. And at a more basic level, if you're a primary care physician or if you are a community neurologist, I think it's important to keep in mind that despite data suggesting that African-American patients have a lower rate of Parkinson's disease incidence, we do know that what we see in these studies is disproportionately lower than compared to the incidence in the United States, for example. So it's quite important to keep in mind that these patients can also be affected by motor and non-motor symptoms, especially cognitive difficulties. It would be important perhaps to screen for cognitive difficulties and also perhaps to take into account some other comorbidities that might play a role into cognition. And besides that, as we were discussing, it's quite important to refer patients to specialists, to movement disorders, neurologists, if needed, and to provide access to a broad level of services, including physical therapy, speech therapy, exercise, as well as levodopa and advanced therapies for Parkinson's disease. One thought I had as well was the idea that Obviously, these patients that you collected data from were seen at Parkinson's centers of excellence. So I wonder if maybe the data might be different if we had a broader cohort of patients that were seen at a broader variety of movement disorders clinics. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point, Jason. Parkinson's disease centers of excellence are centers with a designated and specialized multidisciplinary team, including neurologists, uh, physical occupational therapists, mental health professionals, and others, which do not necessarily reflect the type of care that is provided across the U.S. So I would imagine that if we look at outside the centers of excellence, it's possible that perhaps we have a different scenario where individuals that come from underrepresented or marginalized populations would have even lower health-related quality of life. And we can also hypothesize that they would have even lower access to specialized neurologists, as it was previously demonstrated by other studies. Daniel, before we wrap up here, any other findings that you think are important for a neurologist to know about? Yeah, so when looking at the baseline demographic and clinical data, we also found some interesting characteristics about the disease and some of the services they accessed. We did find that they had similar rates of uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, as well as speech therapy use. However, when looking at advanced therapies such as deep brain stimulation, African-American patients also had a lower rate of neuromodulation compared to white, non-Hispanic individuals. Daniel, I appreciate the work that you and your colleagues put into this paper. Again, the title of the paper is Racial and Ethnic Differences in Health-Related Quality of Life for Individuals with Parkinson's Disease Across Centers of Excellence. Again, this was published in the journal Neurology on April 5th. Daniel, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.